started. I just want to let you know that we have a new show breaking tonight, actually right after this, and it's going to start around nine-ish as soon as we get done with our discussion here. I'm not rushing it because I want us to have plenty of time to talk and make sure that we get as much information and, you know, strategy discussed as we need time for. So no rush. But after this, we're going to do our first breaking video. And that is actually a Periscope show where I'm going to be talking about four videos. And you guys will be interested to know that the band Hennessy is actually opening that show tonight with their video. I've, I've uh, been broken. What is it? I've been broken before. Before, yeah. yeah, after that, we've got Mara Jean coming on with How It Feels, Sherikon Music Attraction with Queen of Everything, and Mara Whitman with Survivors. So those are going to be our first four videos up on the chopping block for discussion. It should be really fun. And I'm looking forward to the show because I wanted to do a live video show, and we've been waiting for this kind of thing. So that's going to be fun. I'm excited. So if you guys want to tune into it, there is information on AVA Live Radio dot com um, about that show and then there's also of course the periscope channel where it's going to be held which is periscope.tv forward slash ABA live radio those of you who are joining us on periscope you guys actually know where that is <laughs> so today we're going to be talking about the music industry and lots of music marketing because I think still there's a huge, huge gap from my side of what the indie artists are talking about. And what they're saying to me is, I can't sell any music. I can't make this a sustainable business model for myself. And how are other people doing it? Now, you guys, of course, I don't, I don't know if all of you are experienced in the point where you've seen major, major money getting made and you've seen little money getting made. I'm sure you've had one or the other and experiences with both. But I, I want to talk about today and using social media to implement that kind of business strategy because there is a lot of money getting made. The problem is, is there's not a lot of people actually making the money. And I find that the breakdown that happens with a lot of our indie artists, especially the new ones coming on to the business, is that they don't really think about the ways in which they can monetize what it is that they're doing. They're concentrating just on play my music, play my music. And it's fine if you want to build the fan base, but that's not always going to be enough to actually get that fan base built. So I think that's where social media comes in in this discussion is how we're using it to actually um, make that connection. And of course, live streaming being something I'm focusing on a lot with you guys today, because I feel like without live streaming, you're really not going to get that powerful connection. And that's what you've seen in the past with people who stick with platforms like YouTube, and they really evolve over years of time, they build a strong audience. And the reason why they're able to do that is because of the power of video. So uh, that kind of starts it off. Now, let me just give you one point before we get kicking, because I know this is going to start your, your juices flowing. When you think of monetizing indie music today, how many people do you figure are really considering their own music brand as an entertainment network? So Jerry, you want to take that one first? Oh, what happened to him? Jerry's on mute somehow. Where's Jerry um, on mute? Can you hear me now? Oh, there he is. Yeah, yeah, I can, can hear, hear you. All right, good. Sorry, this novice stuff. Um, I, I think that it's it's there's not very many that are doing that. That, that are making their own station, their own, you know, to be able to go out and say, brand themselves like us as the Ban Hennessy Network. Mm -hmm. or, or that. I think that's something that's new, and I think it's something that we should really look into. What are, What do you say, Joseph? Yeah, I say, you know, most people probably rightly so are thinking about the product itself. Right. Mm -hmm. Because without a great product, you, nothing else matters. So they get caught up in that. And and then they get caught up in the promotion of that product, not realizing the synergies around that product. Right. Mm -hmm. Of the live performance we played a few days ago. And um, people are always asking for the CD. And when you're starting out, you're a singer songwriter or your band p playing a big place. You don't have a crew. You don't have marketing on the scene. You don't have roadies. You're you're breaking your equipment down. 
and people yeah. would rush the stage. Where is your CD? Where's this? Where's that? And there, that's an economic opportunity that you can discover right there. So the last show, I, I brought a box of CDs. My daughter sold a bunch of them. And, you know, you, you can make money in chunks like that around the surround of the activities that you're doing. So I think that's a, an easy thing for people to do. I do think that they need to, uh, and, and myself included, need to think about branding because that's how you you get loyalty, as you've talked taught as well it's not about the numbers it's about the sustained audience and the interaction of that audience mm -hmm. you might have a, a thousand or fifteen hundred people on a mailing list but maybe a hundred of them are are diehard fans they'll influence others they'll come to the show and i think you start there you know you create products you talk to them what's interesting signing set lists as i discussed with you a few days ago the yeah. little things you know we gave those for free and, and people went crazy we we sold out. We didn't charge for them. But, you know, it's the little things like that you could turn into an economic opportunity. I think yeah. you also have to set your expectations right. You're not going to really make a lot of money at first, regardless of what you do. And, and this is true for big acts like Bruce Springsteen he didn't make money till his third or his fourth album. So you have to be in it for other reasons. You shouldn't give up on the business plan, but there's small ways to make money along the way. And you shouldn't leave those on the table. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. And and the expectations, that's a big thing, isn't it? I mean, a lot of people will start out and maybe they'll be in their first year and they ask me questions like, you know, what, how come I'm not building so fast and how come everybody else has got so many more people on their fan base? And, and the biggest thing I can say is coming from the position of, you know, an online entrepreneur since 1994, I've always built companies around social media fan bases because I've been obsessed with the internet and I'm also obsessed with web building. So, you know, tying in things like SEO and also using the power of social media and the traffic that can drive as kind of a lifter and an introduction are things that you need to start thinking about when you're first building. But patience is really, really key to anything that's worth having and any business that is going to sustain you long term You've got to be committed to it and be willing to put in the time and the energy. And let me just clarify, and I, I did a little bit of this on Twitter in the last couple of days. When I say time and energy, and you guys know, it is an insane amount of time and energy. I mean, it's gotten to the point sometimes, even as far as we've come, where people are like, Jackie, do you ever leave the studio? And I'm like, yeah, I actually do leave the studio. But <laughs> There's a lot of things that you guys are seeing on social media where I'm in the studio often. And I typically kind of take my break and just unplug from things because I'm doing so much behind the scenes as well as on camera. And... I think that any fashion blogger that I've talked to, any online personality, anyone building any kind of career through social media and using these platforms online to do it, even if you're a fashion designer and you're trying to promote a brand that way, it's a lot of time and energy and way more than you'd ever expect to put in there. So as well as making your product perfect, which is, is the you know, the name of the game for everyone, you have to be willing to put that social media time <laughs> in and really connect with each and one of the fans. And I mean, you're, you're supposed to be commenting back with them. You're supposed to reply within 24 hours, if not sooner. Right. I mean, don't leave it for two days. I had, I had an indie artist contact me yesterday and say, well, how come I'm not getting this? And how come I'm not getting that? And I said, because we've sent emails to you for over a week and you haven't replied. So we're of course going to send all of our energy over to the people that are replying like every second, you know, if you're not, if you're not present with us, we don't even know that you're, you, you know, you're paying attention or you even want this. So definitely you want to make uh, contact being your, you know, number one thing when it comes to strategy, right? Yeah. Yeah, everybody's going. <laughs> it is. It's a lot. We're, it's we're a thinking lot of, of, of the guilt of, of the, the <laughs> ones that we missed. <laughs> right? I know. You know, Facebook. Interacting. Has to... I love how Facebook on their public pages, they say, you haven't responded. Your, your percentage rate is going down. Like they remind you every time you tune into your public Facebook page of how good your response rate is, <laughs> just in case you haven't been on that platform. And I think there's a reason for it because they know that people aren't going to stick around that long. But 
again, let's just be realistic. If you're running a lot of social media platforms, of course, you're not going to be on every one every single day of the week. But which ones do you think you should be on more often? Jerry, why don't you take that? Well, I think you just need to look at your demographics of your of your fan base and see where they are. Wherever your fan base is at, that's where you need to be, whether it's Instagram, yes. Snapchat, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, whatever it is, wherever they are, that's where you need to be. I like that. That's a good answer. Very, very good answer. Joseph, what do you think? Where's your energy going? Yeah, I think the, that's absolutely right. But if you're just starting out, I think you can't go wrong on Twitter. That's still, you know, the huge platform and the tagging on Twitter, even Instagram is a way to, to capture thousands of people that aren't in your network. So if you use the hashtag properly and I get, I don't know, sometimes 10, 15, 20 new fans a day when I put something out in a hashtag and people discover that because they're filtering on that hashtag. So I think that is one that you can get a lot of leverage out of. I think these new video platforms are really important. Lab, you know, is starting to catch on, but Periscope being the number one app uh, on the iTunes store last year and seeing a lot of successful celebrities coming out and reaching tens of thousands of people, you know, if it's working for them, I think it's a, an opportunity for independent artists to quickly spin up and get fans at any time of the day around the world. And so a combination of using what's tried and, and, and trusted Facebook Twitter, Instagram, and then trying some of these new formats. I think uh, you know, folks out there in the independent world need to be doing. HD, what do you think? Well, um, you know, I'm a huge stickler for um, the technology and the social media websites. Because mm -hmm. as I mentioned before in our last article in the interview, that you can just do so much in the blink of an eye, you know, um, so you can contact people who are interested in purchasing your music. You can reach out to people who want to you know, network with you and uh, collab with you. Um, and I mean, again, look what, what we're doing right now. We have four people right now that are in totally different remote places and we're all communicating at the same yeah. time. So that's what I believe in technology. I know. And also, I mean, like this is going to go to YouTube after this. So it will be archived. It will, you know, constantly be a method of conversation for people to have moving forward. So you can see the power of live streaming video moving into even a replay kind of situation that, I mean, as you know, you can get this video downloaded and upload it to your Facebook page if you want to. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of options for ways to live stream and, and get it out there. Do you, how, how have you guys, oh, HD looks like he just dropped out. Vernon, maybe you can give it a try and come back in and see if, uh, see if it's something, let's see if we can get Vernon in while HD's getting set. There he comes. Yeah, I hope so. Hey, Vernon. Oh no. His visual, I don't think is working and I don't hear audio yeah. either. Yeah, we hear oh, audio now. I can now. hear yeah. you, Vernon. Can yeah, you let's see if we can hear you. I can hear you, I just can't see you yet. Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> this is what he gets for being up no, at 1 a.m. in the UK. <laughs> it's very dark in the UK right now. Well, I'm happy I can hear you. Oh, dear, <laughs> Keep dear. messing with it a little bit. See if. <laughs> well, well, while you're here, well, though, while you're that's here, just give us your opinion. <laughs> I want to hear your voice on what we've been talking yeah. about. What's what's your view on, uh, you know, where should you be as far as putting the most activity in your social media? Um, I thought Jerry's answer was particularly uh, good. I mean, there were some great answers from everybody, but uh, going where, you know, where the kind of critical mass is, is a really good uh, good place to mm -hmm. kind of start from and build build upon. Um, I also was interested in your your response, you know, where uh, emails get sent out and somebody doesn't respond. Uh, and there, there is a lot to be said for trying to respond as quickly as you can. Um, if you've got the technology and means to do that in amongst all the busy stuff yeah. that we were all, were all you know involved in so some really good points there but i, I think certainly um yeah targeting those uh through them through the social media platforms 
that are engaging with you more often. Yeah, that's a great. A good answer. Your... Very, very good answer. So are we going to get to see video? I hope <laughs> see him. mess with your video a little bit. Let's see while I uh, <laughs> just take the floor a little bit for a second. I wanted you guys to to get some information that I actually did some research on this week in speaking with some of our you know, advisors, especially through YouTube and some of the live streaming. And um, there's a big, a big importance in being able to think about monetizing what you're doing out there. And, you know, indie artists tend to be very introverted at heart. And I think that's a wonderful thing because when you do speak, you typically speak right from your heart, you know, and that's a, and that's actually a good voice to have on social media. Now using things like live streaming to create video content is really, really important because that's actually where it's at today. That's where the, the strongest connections and the most powerful connections are actually being made between the indie artist and their fans. But what we're not thinking about is past building the actual brand, producing the product, into making the money. And the reason why it's so, so important is because if you can't sustain yourself through music, then ultimately you're either going to get discouraged or you're going to end up in a situation where you can't afford to keep putting out the music. And that's why I'm here, because I want to make sure that whatever we're doing and whatever discussions we're having about building our social media networks, we're also addressing the point that it's not all about the digital downloads, because remember that when somebody downloads your music, as you well know, it's probably not going to be at 99 cents a really big income for you, especially just starting out because you have a limited amount of people that will actually see it. There's just too much music out there and you it's going to be up to you to get it in front of people. But a lot of times with that, we talk about, you know, when you personally deliver a tweet to someone and say, hey, will you please listen to my music? They're probably getting a lot of those and you're not going to stand out that way. So then we move on to how are we going to monetize? Well, my big point and what I have talked about all week with some of our affiliates and, and uh, our partners is the power of monetization. And what it really stands and, and comes down to is how visible are you and how reactive is your fan base? Because when you go to monetize things, and I talk about, um, I'm talking about like, say you create a music video and you wanna raise funds to make that music video each and every time you make it. You've got two things. You've got the ability of your fan base to actually be there for you and say, hey, we wanna see a music video on this song. Yeah, I'll give you $5, I'll give you $10, I'll give you a pre-sale on your, on your album so that you have enough funding to not only finish the album or the EP, but also to make the music videos. But what else can you do to monetize besides just getting your fan base to stick in with you? And a lot of the answers talked about making sure that your fan base, first of all, is something that can be monetized. And how do we do that? We look to the stats. Now, one thing that I did write down that I wanted to share with you guys, and I did promise this to you through social media, was four things that I focus on when I'm trying to build a really strong brand. I don't think I've ever really talked about it before. I think I've maybe taken one piece or another, but the four big things that I want you all to be really thinking about as you try to build this brand of indie music is one, the connection to your audience. Now we always talk about it, we talked about it today. It's nurturing what really counts. It's talking back to them in a real way other than just come here for me, just be there for me. It's actually caring about what they have to say and taking those comments and saying, yeah, you're right. I see what you're saying. You know what I mean? Because they're so, so valuable. Now we see brands all the time hit Facebook and the reason why they do is because they want that conversation. They want that feedback, good, bad, whatever it is that they have to say, they wanna hear it because it's the only voice that they actually get 
from somebody who doesn't buy them or does buy them. And they want to know what the user experience is. And if you're not paying attention to that, then you're really doing yourself an injustice. And I don't care if it's really hard to take. It's going to be sometimes because they're going to have things to say that maybe you're not always going to want to swallow. But I can honestly say it's only going to make you better and it's going to make you stronger and it's going to build character. So you're in the public eye. You're in the entertainment business. It's time to you know suck it up and actually let it actually do you some good. You know, that's one thing I always look is that connection and I listen to them. And I'll tell you, even if somebody is a total heckler and they're a troll, you can kind of see where it's coming from and know the value of the opinion, whether you should take it for what it is or not. And that's your own judgment, right? But you do realize that at the end of the day, if somebody doesn't like something you've put out, there's got to be some kind of reason why they don't. Either it's just a bad move on their part, or it's actually, there's like a little reason, like maybe something's a little off, or maybe something could be done a little better, or, you know, it, there's some kind of note to be taken from it. So I want you guys to really, really pay attention to what's being said about you out there, because it really does make a huge difference. The other thing, and you've got enough confidence, believe me, to withstand it. <laughs> you do. I know you guys do. The second thing is value of content. The value of content that everyone is always, always talking about is so important. And when we say value of content, I know it's easy to like get that muddled and not really understand what it is. It just means what does this have to do with the people who are coming back to your pages for it? Does it actually serve them in any way and how? So if you have a song, it's really great for instance to not just say, hey, it's new, come check it out. It's really good to describe the song, talk about the song, talk about the value and why you wrote it. Because your job as a marketer and a seller is to establish some kind of perceived value. And even if that's in artwork, it's your job to do it. And if you fail to do it, that's going to reflect in your sales. So when people say indie artists aren't making money there, it's not true. They're making money, but the thing they've been able to do is establish the value to the customer and the consumer. And the consumer is coming and saying, oh my gosh, I love everything they have to put out. I like what the brand stands for. I know what they're all about on face value. And that's why I invest in this indie artist. So if you're not selling, you're missing some component there. So you got to look at it and look at it really closely. The third Third thing is delivery of the message. And that means using different social medias, using live streaming, which is what I'm always talking about, because I feel like that delivers the message just hard and it really drives it home. And it allows you to have that authentic conversation and get the feedback at the same time. And also it's a time saver for you guys. So you're kind of getting all of this power into one thing. So the delivery of the message is really, really important. And then uh, making sure it's quality and making sure that delivery system has value. The fourth thing is the collection of the analytics analytics. Now by collection, I mean, use pages, use Twitter, use Reverb Nation, use anything you can to find out if people are actually clicking through from your posts to where you want them to go. Because when at the end of the day, your manager or somebody says, hey, I really want you to wear our sunglasses and we're going to pay you to do it. Or I'd like to do a new line of products around you. And we want to see if your fan base would actually be down with having you know, a, a sunglass that you wear in your video that you've designed and you've gotten on board with us as some kind of collaboration. But how do we know if there's a sale value to your fan base? Do they really follow you? Do, you, do they really want to wear what you're wearing? If you don't know that, then nobody is going to be able to collaborate with you. It's not that they don't want to. It's just that they won't be able to because the figures aren't there and they're going to have to put their money and their time and energy behind the product. So monetization has a lot to do with your fan base and how solid it is. And that's why I'm saying, if you feel like it takes a long time to build it, it's worth it because you can see where that value will really pay off in the end. All right. So what do you guys think? Jerry, you want to start? Oh, oh. Okay. Well, I'm out. I, 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 with everything that thing. Um, um, I know that we've started I've been talking to the girls from uh, the band Hennessy, and uh, I'm going to be talking with my new band that I'm going to be working with. That I want them; to, they're starting to use Snapchat a lot to be able to respond because we were talking just what you taught us about having responses and and having interactions with the fans. 
Well, I, yeah. I was thinking about that a lot. And I said, well, why should we just send them a message that says thanks? Or why should we have an auto responder that says, hey, I'm glad you found us. Why don't you check us out on Facebook? You know, yeah. rather than do all that, now I we love- can go back. And when we see somebody following us or fanning us or liking us or retweeting or reposting or whatever, we can actually have the girls go in there and do a five second Snapchat and say, Hey, Jacqueline, I appreciate you fanning us like that. We really look forward to seeing you at our next show. By the way, it's going to be April the 30th at Moe's Irish Pub. You know, that's insane. That Love it. Seconds, but you're getting a special, a special thank you for being the fan. That's like so outrageous. That's so outrageously good. I love it. And that's, you know, I found that you guys have one of the most reactive fan bases that I've experienced. And I love that about you. I think that the people that you have on your fan base are really, really there for you guys. And I love that you're being really vocal, Jerry, about how you're getting to that point, because there's huge strength coming from your side, not only in, uh, you know, the Banna Hennessy's quality of product, which I love, but also the fact that your fans just show up for you guys and they really, really are dedicated. So that's a great, great insight on how you're doing that. Joseph, what do you think? So I like the idea of the the story behind the song and it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, here's what the song's about. You know, it was a dark winter night and, you know, there was tragedy, you know, occurring. It doesn't have to be the story behind the, the lyrics so much. You could do a little bit of that but even a little bit about you know what you were thinking, where you were when you wrote it, um, what mood you were in, how the song came about. The last five shows we did, I, I started telling stories about the songs more so to give the, the guys time to get the equipment working. You know, you're learning your new <laughs> set and you know, everything doesn't work. You, you know, you're buying time, but you're, you're telling stories. Uh, and uh, one of the stories I told was the fastest song I ever wrote was about kids running around the neighborhood ding dong ditching it's a song (laughs) called uh, mama don't call me home and we we had run into rob halford the lead singer of uh judas priest years ago i think it was uh, in the 50 50th grammys or something eight years ago and we're talking to him about it and he was encouraging us you know you know go go get it get that heavy metal sound and i'm like a a folk singer songwriter so so, today that's a (laughs) challenge let's go get a heavy metal sound to this thing in just telling the story of running into Rob and his advice, how he embraced us, the, the first time he ever wore a tuxedo in his life, probably the last time, you know, you, and what we we're thinking about, you know, these kids running around the neighborhood and most of the parents were, were you know, freaking out, trying to get their kids back. And I ran in the basement and just wrote a song about you know, kids running around the neighborhood. And it turned out to be one of the best live songs we've ever done. We put a sax solo over the heavy metal uh, pattern and we got something unique. It's actually in Reverb Nation dot com slash joseph pagano you can hear the live recording from the stone pony the other day and yeah the timing was off the bands all over the place but we stayed together as we made mistakes we said it was our mutual dysfunction in our reaction to that live that made it a, a great recording and people came up after the show and they said you know the, the song was awesome it was great it was different than everything else but the story you know was just as important the the story you told before the song and i I didn't really grasp that until this last show and I had been doing it for four or five shows. So I think there's a lot to that. I saw David Gilmore from Pink Floyd uh, on YouTube. It was an older interview, but he was talking about wish you were here, the album. And the interviewer was saying, David, you know, you're you're a rock icon. You guys came off of of maybe the best, uh, most successful album ever recorded in dark side of the moon. You know, you're, you're in your mid twenties. You get back in the studio for Wish You Were Here. That must have been awesome. And he said, you know, that the honest truth is it was kind of a disaster. Like, you can go see this this interview. We thought we knew what we were doing. We get it. Nobody had any ideas. It was going pretty horrible in the studio. Who the heck would have ever thought that? And I I listened more to that interview than I listened to the album in the last year. I, I was fascinated by the story. He said, we had to relearn how to do this. And finally, when we, we got our confidence back, you know, the idea started coming in and, you know, we started getting back into it. But hearing the greatest of the great go through these struggles, um, you know, there's a human element to that. And I think there's an economic behind that. It draws people in. They're interested. And you, you can drive some loyalty around that. So we're going to do a little bit more of that as we go. 
I love that. I, I have to say, yeah, when I go to listen to live music or if I'm watching even YouTube videos, I love it when there's a story. And, you know, it also reminds me of a uh, group called, oh, what are they called? I'll think of them. I always, I always forget right when I get to it, but they built their whole fan base on YouTube. And there's several of them that actually I've, I've well, the Georgia line did that. What's that? Florida, Florida, Georgia line, a country band. They started out, they did their whole fan base on YouTube and that's where they were discovered. Oh yeah. Yeah. There's a lot. There's quite a lot. And you know, it's not just in covers, although YouTube tends to be really reflective of covers. You'll get a lot more play just because of whatever's the current cover. People love to hear it by different bands. They don't, they kind of get away from liking the song from the original artist and they really get addicted to, to seeing it done by other artists. And that's a great way to get in that feed, you know? So I, I really do encourage people if you're going to do YouTube to build some covers into your channel. In fact, we're going to be doing some covers for you guys on breaking video. That's going to be one of those things that we will allow is you don't have to have just an original. It would be great to see you guys doing different cover versions, even if it's an old song that you've remade. And I think that that's, there's a real value to it because it, it really is a unique perspective. But I feel like that little intro into the video, even on YouTube of a personal acknowledgement of why you did this song or how it came about. It's kind of got that VH1 storytellers kind of aspect to it. And I used to watch that all the time and I used to be addicted to it. I had to sit up late at night and watch every single episode, even, you know, the replays on YouTube. That is where we got the idea for the behind the music. So I feel like not doing it on stage and not doing it in music videos is really just, you know, kind of being a, missing in a, in a personal connection that you could actually have. So I'm glad that you guys are talking about Absolutely. it. Yeah. yeah. So Vernon, Vernon, what do you think? Uh, yeah. I mean, some, some really good uh, points there. I think for, for me connecting with people um, uh, and, I think as uh, Joseph was saying, uh, you know, sort of telling a bit of a story is really good. I, I just, I like to make people kind of uh, smile and laugh. And yeah. Have fun. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, there's kind of, there are, there, you know, there are some songs that you do that are a bit more thought provoking, thoughtful, um, uh, pondering ones. But um, a, a lot of the time I, I kind of want to really encourage people to have fun, enjoy themselves. Um, Cause there's a lot of tough stuff out there for people. It is. So if you could for an hour or an hour and a half, you know, make people smile, make, uh, help people to dance uh, and really kind of embrace some of the positive aspects of life. That really, really um, is something that I, I'm, I'm keen uh, and I try and do. I, do. I do covers as well as my own songs. Uh, but one of the key things is I'm always um, encouraging, you know, sort of members of the audience or the crowd or diners or whoever's there you know to kind of uh smile you know uh, one of one of the things i say which is just you know just a bit of fun really i say free smiles over here <laughs> and, uh, it's really inter it's really interesting seeing people's kind of responses you know sometimes i might do it in if i'm playing at a restaurant and people have eaten their meal and they're leaving and other people are coming i'm I, you know i kind of sing stuff to them i make stuff up on the spot you know, and, and, and sing it to them. And it really does kind of uh, connect with people. And they, they kind of remember uh, you for that. They think, they could, oh, this is just not somebody who's just kind of doing, going through the motions. This is somebody who really is passionate and enjoys what they're doing. I even do my sound checks. Uh, you know, if I'm doing a sound check, there's people there, uh, I will sing the sound check. So, you know, so again, <laughs> one, two, one, two, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I'll actually sing stuff. I'll make stuff up and... Uh, it's really fun just to see people's uh, reactions. I'm sorry you can't see me, but I've got a problem with my webcam and Windows 10. <laughs> I, am on, okay. uh, Peris I am on Periscope at the moment as well. Though. <laughs> no worries, no worries. I, I can hear you just fine. <laughs> That's fine. The um, if if uh, hopefully I don't know if if we can even put your picture up there. That would be kind of cool too. <laughs> I'm not really sure how to do it. I don't want to touch anything just in case. I'll have to look into that for the next <laughs> time just to make sure. <laughs> But, you know, I, I love that, you know, Vernon, that's really charming. And I think that that's that is true entertainment and something that you don't really see from uh, the, the the large stage shows. A lot of times when people get up, you know, on a big festival 
you know, kind of arena, mm -hmm. they miss that intimacy that we have as Absolutely. indie artists that we get on the internet shows or being able to do a Periscope or being at a smaller venue or even like the, the, uh, the house parties that people are doing all the time where they get that intimate group. And I, I just want to say that like even Taylor Swift is known to do house parties. She does it all the time. She'll invite like groups of the best fans, the, the hardcore fans to see her in person. Even at this level, she still does it. And I think that that has been one of the reasons why they consider her the music business, because she is actually leading um, everyone in everything. She's leading social media. She's leading, you know, she's winning the awards because her fan base is so strong. And it's, I think, because they all have and feel that they have an opportunity at one time or another to meet her in person, even as big as she gets. And it's really important not to forget that because as you grow, it will be more difficult for you to keep, you know, that level of intimacy, but it's the opportunity that she offers people to be able to get in touch with her closely that is the really important thing to, you know, to be able to master even at that level. And uh, good, good stuff, guys. Good stuff. So let's talk about crowdfunding a little bit. Um, I, I love crowdfunding because every single time I think of how how have I ever monetized things for people? And the big thing has been in the <laughs> upcoming stuff that's coming out, the new releases. It's always been a bigger dollar amount. It's always been a larger seller. And I feel like if you have a, uh, a fan that's coming on board with you or you have a fan that's really dedicated to you, it's really important to say, hey, you know, I've got this EP I want to release, or I have this album coming out. Here's the first song. Here's the idea. Here's my personal video message to you. I want you to get on board with me on this. And I think that there's a powerful suggestion in allowing people to do something special and actually be in it with you. Now, a lot of indie artists, of course, say, I don't want to ask people for money, but I don't feel like crowdfunding is asking people for money. I feel like crowdfunding is a great conversation to have. And it's a way of saying, hey, I've got some special things that I'm putting out for you and you're only going to get them here as part of my pre-sale. So help me boost my numbers. Help me sell 500 albums. Help me sell 5,000 albums, whatever it is, because that coming out of the gate is going to be good for me. It's going to build my career and it's going to show me that you actually want to hear this music. You know, that's that's far different than begging for money because that's not what crowdfunding is really meant to do. Crowdfunding is meant to put a really strong voice in front of an artist. And I've seen people make major money doing it. And it's been part of a, a key component to the average business model of larger indie music uh, brands and their labels and their music marketers. I've seen people who have been in this business for a long, long time take indie bands and crowdfund the projects and do it on each and every project as part of their business model. And that's how they sell, like decide how many jewel cases they're going to actually produce. And that's how the, the people can actually get something special from the artist because they've got a pre-sale on the t-shirt. They've got a pre-sale on calendars, posters, whatever it is that they're putting out that you wouldn't be able to get at any other time if you don't do it in the pre-sale. How do you guys feel about it? Absolutely, Absolutely right. right. <laughs> good, good, all right. That's good. Good thing. Um, yeah, I think, is there anything else that you guys want to contribute to the conversation about making money in music? Is there any, any experience that you've had that maybe has failed or that you've tried that has really, really worked? Any kind of, you know, information that you want to offer our, our people out there? I want to say something just on uh, further about what Joseph had said about mm -hmm. the intimacy that he was having, or the, when he was, when he made that when they made that great song from what was a conceived of as a mistake. Um, <laughs> or whatever. I, I think like our band, we're often told when we're on concert, whenever we are anywhere they are, the girls they come up to me all the time about how so many people say, oh, we loved your sound, we loved your CD, you, you know, we loved your song, but you are so much better in person. And, <laughs> and, and that's the greatest compliment they can get because that, yeah. that shows not only that the music is 
the same when it comes out of their voices as it does when it comes out of the out of the CD. But it's also that they're having a connection with that. And and our our girls when they sing this song, we'll have fans lined up in front of them, videoing it, crying, just crying when it's when it's one of these emotional songs because they feel what the band feels, and the band, the girls feed off of that because they're very emotional with the fans. Our fan base is incredible. Like what well, you said it before, we, we, the girls love the fans, the fans love the girls and I love them all um, <laughs> in both sides, you know, cause I get to see on both sides. I get to see the band side. I get to see the fan side. Um, yeah. basically, I'm one of their biggest fans, but I also have to make sure that things run as they need to be. And, yeah. uh, but the, the, the people that come up to us and tell us how much better that they were in person just tends to leads to what you're saying about monetizing about doing the little something a little extra because if they're already getting that little extra emotion from you or that little extra feeling of being special then anything that you can do to give them something special whether it's crowdfunding or whether it's just a quick snapchat either way if it's a personalized thing that means that much more to them and they're more likely to share with other people because the whole thing is about it's not about having cd sales anymore it's about getting that song on somebody's phone because they share phone mu music more than they share CD music. And if you can get them somebody to download it and share it with somebody and share it with somebody and share it with somebody, that's where you're going to get your organic increase. Love it. So true. So true. That's a that's the power of viral sharing on social media. You know, it's that emotional connection. Have you ever noticed, though, that um, if you go to share something, you've had some kind of emotional response to whatever it is, like it's made you laugh or it's made you feel inspired or, you know, it's been something that has helped you in some way or given you some kind of emotional response. Have you ever noticed that? Exactly. Yeah, I, I often share the things that I share are not really because I have to share them, but because I've had some kind of connection with them in some way. And I always think about that when I try and be mindful of my posts. I mean, I've got a level of posting that I have to do um, to notify people of what's coming up. And that tends to be a little impersonal because it's like, you know, it's it's another show and, you know, make sure that you don't miss the time and the date. But when it comes to sharing things that I'm reading that I'm emotionally connecting with, those are the ones that I always pick to share. And I like stuff like that. Just you have to be careful with that. What's that? I said, you have to be careful with that too and realize just like anything in business or service business or anything else that we're in, if you do, if you, if you snub or if you put off a fan, even if it's an accident, you know, you had a busy day or whatever and you, some fan, Mis has a misconception of what you're saying to them or not saying to them, that fan, you know, if you do something nice to somebody, they may go out and tell five or 10 people. But if you do something that they conceive as a snobbish thing, they're going to tell a thousand people. And oh, so yeah. One, one bad yeah. reaction is worth, yeah. you know, it, you, it takes about a <laughs> hundred to make up for it. It is. It's so true. It's so true. I have, I've have had many. Well, I have, I want to say I haven't had any instant, instant, in like cases where people are mad at me, except if I don't answer right away. So then usually if, if I feel like, you know, like right now, I just happen to have a starting out in April, I had like 8,000 emails. <laughs> I was like, all right, I'm either going to have to take my time with these and really, you know, cut through them, or I'm going to have to get some help. And I don't want it to be impersonal. So I'm doing my best to get through them. But I'll usually throw up something on social media saying, hey, guys, you know, um, I'm, I'm not getting to all these emails as fast as you'd like. So either don't send them here or, <laughs> or, you know, make sure that you take your, you know, just be patient with me. And several times a year that actually does happen to me, especially on Facebook. Like I know that Vernon was trying to get a hold of me and wondering if, if I was going to answer him because I took a little bit, like it took maybe two days. And I told him, I said, send it to the other email because I might not check Facebook as fast <laughs> as you'd like right now, because there's a lot of stuff coming through on Facebook. <laughs> the delights of uh, time zone differences as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure, right? But I'm so glad you're here, Vernon. I'm glad you're here with us, Joseph. How how Thank do you, you feel about all? No, <laughs> uh, we'll see you next time. We'll, we know you're hiding. Made up an yeah. excuse about your camera. 
That's what that, it is. I think that <laughs> he probably, you know, it's one. You're so right, Joseph. It's one a.m., two a.m., and it was almost two o'clock like, in the morning. I'm not I turning this damn thing on. <laughs> it Smart is. guy, <laughs> blame it on the computer. It's to create that mystique, you see, a mystery. Yeah, that's right. That's what it is. Like a, a lens cap or something, right? Anyway, <laughs> yeah, there, there's a lot to be said about licensing. Uh, you know, a lot of people make money only today on, on two things. It's live performance. And I mean, you know, you can make little amounts of money on all these other things we've been talking about. But live performance is, is really where they start to make in the thousands and, and can make a career out of it. And the second yeah. is licensing. And uh, I know that Jerry brought up the phone thing. I got to come back to that. I had a couple of offers to license ringtones and phone stuff. And, I'm, you know, I might come back to it. I still have the opportunity, but I'm like, ah, you know, got so many other things yeah. going on. But that's where it can scale into the thousands, millions, if somebody uh, likes uh, what you're doing there. Um, television, radio, you don't have to think national networks. There's a lot of small business opportunities to license something or just to write something for that purpose. So I know people that make money, um, mm -hmm. you know, on that side of, of the uh, you know, the business is that, you know, small type of licensing. It, it can get larger as well. But, you know, something to consider. And then the third is the holiday song thing that uh, I know some very – senior professionals in the business and they said you know just do one or two holiday songs and they grow like wildfire you know people love them they don't care who did it and you know people um uh you know th this guy peter bliss in new york he runs the new york collective songwriters community i'm part of that and he wrote this big in sync christmas tune that you know was a hit and it's on all these you know now cds and everything and the guy did really yeah. really well and you went yeah. to all these seminars saying, write a damn holiday song. You never know what's going to happen. Well, <laughs> in sync might record it. And so there's there's yeah. people that make money uh, just on the holiday thing. So there's other things That's to true. think about. And finally, I want to say that this fan connection is super important. And it's not just for the independent artist. My daughter, Julia, and she's also my creative director for album art and you know just overall presence out there. She um, is a big fan of Demi Lovato. And I joke with her. I said, you know, you're probably on the restraining order list right now. I'm, I'm waiting for this <laughs> envelope to show up in the mail. You know, she meets her at book signings and, you know, all over the city when she's on Good Morning America. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, my daughter got a call. Hey, you know, what are you doing? I think it was a Thursday. Can you come down to the MTV studio? Demi's going to be getting this big uh, achievement award on the GLAAD annual award show. And it's going to be on Logo TV. And, you know, of course, my daughter cancels everything. She goes down to the studio. They filmed her. And she was on the award show last night, my daughter, with uh, Jennifer Lopez, Ryan Seacrest, Kim Kardashian. They were all filmed with testimonials to, to what Demi's doing, you know, out in the world and, and doing good for everyone. And my daughter was right in the middle of all these famous people. They just <laughs> took people off the street. They knew we were super fans. And, uh, you know, that's what the greats of the greats do. And, and uh, Taylor Swift was there as well, giving an award to somebody else. So they're very involved in, in making sure they're integrating the frontline fans, not just the, the you know, the famous fans and, and so on. So I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned, you know, from that kind of approach. I, I totally agree with you. That's all great, great advice. And I think that this this uh, panel is actually one of the best ones we've, we've come out with so far. I really like the way it's turning. I, I do want to address two things, too, that you you mentioned. Merchandise, um, we don't talk about enough. There's more than just the average merchandise, you know, like I, I was Facebooking some information about Beyonce today. And the reason why I was doing it is because there are a lot of uh, mainstream artists that are really changing up the way that they merchandise products and what they offer out there. And I know as indie artists, and especially if you're you're not at the level where you're going to start major, major uh, amounts of merchandise, it can be just one thing that you offer that's that much different. So you might want to look through some of uh, some of the things that she's putting out. She's doing, you know, at this point, she's so big that she's doing major collaborations. She's doing fashion lines. She's doing, you know, all kinds of things with her 
her image is on it or something, you know, a value on it that, that marks that it's hers, that makes it unique and unusual, but don't limit yourself to the, the traditional merchandise. And I've had even indie artists come on and do like uh, dog tags where they've put their music on a USB on a dog inside a dog tag. And I thought that was like the coolest thing. And they gave them out to fans and they sell them. And that's how they distribute their music is through dog tags that are actually USB ports. So there's a lot of things you can get done still through, you know, Mexico or China to get them done at a reasonable um, cost and just maybe get 100 or 300 of them to promote you, you know, that's an unusual piece. And I want you guys thinking about that because there's so many options aside from what's traditionally offered that you could be offering on these crowdfunding projects or on your merchandise stores that nobody has. The other thing is sync licensing. Like Joseph said, let's not forget sync licensing. I mean, I forget to mention it because we're doing these sync licensing deals or preparing them through AVA Live Radio where we help you guys find sync licensing uh, through things like NBC and, and indie films as well as networks. And that's a, a big part of my job is trying to find routes for that and, and make sure that those deals go off flawlessly the very, very first time that they do on these packages, because it's important to get them done really, really well and get them done in a solid way where you're not cleaning up any messes later. But like you said, sync licensing is definitely something that you all should get into. And it's a very, very lucrative thing to get into because it keeps paying you all the way down the road. The only pitfall that I've seen is the companies that you get in bed with aren't all on the up and up and they do try and pay you as little as possible for your, you know, the, the value that you actually should establish. Meanwhile, they're out there selling it to larger properties. So you want to make sure that you really protect yourself and you get all the information before you get in the sync licensing game. And if you are uh, not great with contracts, be sure to at least have the first go around overseen by someone you trust, whether it be an attorney or, you know, a music manager that's done this before. And that's why ABA Live Radio does a lot in getting into the sync licensing business, because at least as a group, we can help you guys get your things into sync licensing deals by making sure that we have that really solid solid, you know, route to do it and make sure it's with a good company, somebody who's not going to take advantage of you. And at least you have some representation or some layer of protection in between yourselves and, you know, where that song is going to end up. Good stuff. Good stuff. All right, guys, thanks for joining me. Yeah, we need a whole show on sync licensing. <laughs> we need to get one of the uh, managers up here and one of the music attorneys up here and uh, some people that I, I talk to all the time about sync licensing and get them advising the, the large majority because not everybody's going to get the opportunity to do it through AVA Live Radio, but I know that you guys, you know, you probably get asked a lot about, you know, if you want to sync license a song or two or put it on uh, somebody's rouster so that they can sell it for you. And there's a lot to it. So don't take it lightly and make sure that you're getting the value that you deserve. Because remember, once you license that song, there should be a cap on the amount of time that you license it for and also what you're getting paid. Just a little, <laughs> it's just going in, just a little bit of information, just in case those of you who are listening uh, don't know anything about it. So guys, thank you so much for joining me. I love this, these music panels and I love that you're, you're willing to be a part of it. These are our live streamers, by the way, everyone, people that are involved with AVA Live Radio through our live streaming 2016 event. This goes off every single Tuesday. You meet somebody new on our live stream and get to hear their music. Hopefully they perform for us and do all kinds of really cool things through the live stream. If you want to subscribe, the best way to do it, since we do simulcast all these shows on different networks, go to avaliveradio.com so that you don't miss one single day of anything we've got going on. But the live streaming events typically do happen through Blab and Periscope at the present time. So you might want to tune into those and, you know, stay, stay watching on Tuesdays for what we've got coming out for you guys. You guys have a great night. And don't forget breaking video is next. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Great to meet you, Jerry. Great to meet you, Joseph. Nice Thank to meet you. Great to meet you, Vern. Sorry to Bye. keep you up. Bye. <laughs>
<laughs> good night, <laughs> Vernon. Have Let's a sleep. good night. Good night. Thank you. <laughs> Bye-bye. Take care, guys. Bye, Joseph. Thanks, everyone, for joining me. This is Jacqueline Jacks for AVA Live Radio. We'll see you again next time. Coming up, breaking video. It's over on periscope.tv forward slash AVA Live Radio.